Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. I am with Colonel Tim Nye, mm-hmm. Dr. Lara Pence. Yes. Mary and our producer, Andrea on the sound. I'm Johnny. Um, you know what? We're in Fenway. Mm-hmm. And you think that'd be the best thing about being in Boston, being at Fenway Park? I've come to learn the best thing about being in Boston is you can tap into some pretty extraordinarily intelligent people. And yeah, don't forget the chowder. How fortunate are we? You know, today we've got a guy, Dr. Jeff Karp from Karp Labs, right. one of the top professors in medicine at Harvard. And, um, but he's this incredibly accessible guy. He, he, he came in, he was super humble, um, seems super young for how accomplished he is. That, that was really surprising. Yeah, and just, and really was able to help us see new ways of seeing things. It was really awesome to watch. So I'm not going to give away too much because you're going to, you're going to see all this in the interview, but, um, but I just want to say like, we're so lucky week after week as every Tuesday we publish, we've got these incredible people. Um, we've got about 300 now. So join us. Cause we'll be back at the end to kind of talk about what we get from this and what maybe we would encourage you to become available to get as well. We are here at Fenway for Spartan Up Podcast, and I am with Dr. Jeff Karp from Karp Labs, who's your director of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Yeah, I run a research lab there. I have about 20, 25 people in my lab, and we work on all kinds of different medical problems uh, and try to create therapies that can help patients in the near future. And you surround yourself with a bunch of smart people, so you like you curate smart. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, my my laboratory, we have uh, people, it's highly multidisciplinary. We have people who are biologists. We have people who are engineers. We have doctors. We've had a gastrointestinal surgeon in the lab, a a cardiac surgeon, a dentist, um, a lot of expertise that I don't know about. Um, And what I try to do is create a lateral environment in my lab uh, and really focus on breaking down problems and looking for unique insights um, that can be meaningful for for patients, and hopefully we develop technologies that don't just end up in academic papers, but uh, can actually be brought to patients in the near future. You, you started six companies. <clears throat> yeah, I started uh, started six companies. Uh, those companies have have raised about 180 million dollars. And um, uh, there's uh, two that are based in Paris. Um, there's, uh, you know, I have to make sure I get the math right here. I'm not very good at math. Um, there, there's a bunch that are in, in the Boston area, and then there's one based in Connecticut. And, and everything you're focused on, I mean, you've got all these uh, multidisciplinary uh, folks sitting around you. What, what are you really focused on? What, you, what problem are you trying to solve? So we are focused on, so I think that's actually one of the, the, the things that, um, I, that's challenged me a lot throughout life is to have a focus. In fact, um, someone said to me early on in my faculty position, they're like, you know, Jeff, you're working on too many different things. You need to focus. Um, and, you know, otherwise no one's really going to understand what you do. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I like to take advice to heart and I really think deeply about it. And I really tried to narrow down what we were doing in the lab, but I realized that that just wasn't me and that, that didn't work for, for what was, you know, driving me uh, internally. And so um, what I've accepted is that, uh, you know, I like to work on lots of different things and be continually learning about new areas that I don't know that much about and really be applying, I think, of engineering as a degree in problem solving. And um, it's really about, you know, there's maybe one or two percent of all the information in a particular field that's essential to know to solve a problem Um, and then you need to surround yourself with the people who are experts in each of the disciplines Um, and so it's learning to work with those people but then also you know applying a a very rigorous problem solving strategy and so we apply that to all kinds of different problems so i I wouldn't have guessed that is that is that true you only need one percent of knowledge in a particular area to solve a problem or, or is, is, are you just throwing that number out there? Yeah, I mean the number, I, I don't know, I mean the number we, we could kind of quibble over the, the, the exact number and I, I, don't know, I don't know the exact number but I mean maybe another way of saying it that um, that, that may be more closer to how, how it is is um, I look at I think you know we never fully understand a problem when we start working on it, and I think there's a tendency to jump right towards the solution based on taking the knowledge that we have available. And what I like to do is look at it as if we don't actually understand the problem um, for a while, and we need to conduct experiments to better understand the problem. And if we do that, 
insights emerge that will guide us towards unique solutions. And so, so I think for that process to occur, you don't need to know everything in a field. You need to be able to ask lots of questions and be able to identify the people who would be able to give answers um, and then also be able to construct models to, to test very specific you know, um, things that can guide you towards those unique insights that maybe others have overlooked. Give, a, give us a, a real life example, something that somebody watching or listening could, uh, could apply to their own life of, of, a, of a problem that they might not fully understand. Yeah. Um, so there are m- many potential examples. Um, not sure this is the best one, but um, w- one example is um, we were interested a number of years ago uh, in uh, in brain cancer and trying to develop uh, a new approach. And it's one of these conditions where is almost a hundred percent. Uh, you know, chance that you're going to die within a year, year and a half, like glioblastoma is very aggressive type of cancer. And so, um, you know, we we looked in the literature to try to better understand, you know, maybe an angle that we could take um, to make an advance. And so what I did is I made a, a, I arranged a meeting with Patrick Wen, who directs the brain cancer trials at Dana-Farber. So he's one of the world leaders. And I said, start, just started asking lots of questions to him. And I said, you know, why, why haven't current approaches worked? Like, what, what do you think would be necessary in a, a future approach to really work well? And he said, I, I don't think the drugs are toxic enough. Um, and, uh, and that's a big, big problem that cells, the cancer cells have the ability to, you can knock them down, but they have repair mechanisms and then they get back up and keep going. Um, and then I went and met with uh, Chuck Stiles, who runs a, a basic uh, um, brain cancer lab at Harvard. And I asked him the same series of questions. And he said, well, you know, there's there's one approach is um, to remove the primary tumor from the brain and then put these little wafers in to that space that can release drugs. But um, the drugs that are being used are not, um, you know, they're used in such small quantities and they don't they don't diffuse into the brain very well. And uh, what we need is something like butter on buttered popcorn. We need that to perfuse through the brain because when metastasis occurs, you know, when the cancer comes back, um, it's coming back in lots of different places in the brain, and and that drug can't get to those places. It just doesn't doesn't it doesn't diffuse far enough. Um, and so those were that. So to me, that was kind of like breaking down the problem and really looking for insights that you may not get from reading the literature, and then. Through doing that, we were able to come up with an approach um, that could address those those challenges, and 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 so we and I could talk about the the approach, but um, but but it's that kind of thing, like really going and talking to the expert, experts and just asking lots of questions to really understand the problem to identify unique insights that may help drive a, a new solution. And and does it help when you have these uh, different expertise experts in your office? Right, uh, engineering backgrounds, different medical backgrounds. Does that help take a completely unique approach to once you've asked the question yeah, and you've yeah. got some answers, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in my laboratory, we have um, there's almost so I've tried to structure it so that we have almost no or minimal overlap in the expertise of the people in the lab. And so, what that does is, you know, because we just have people from all sorts of different backgrounds, we're sitting around a table brainstorming. Everyone can give a unique perspective, um, you know, and others can't come up with it because they don't have that expertise. And then everyone feels validated um, because they're contributing to to a solution. And I think it, you know, just creates this win-win environment um, where, and, and I feel like when people feel validated and they're contributing, they're more willing to go all in. And uh, and that's really my goal is to create the conditions in the lab for people to go all in because we're trying to solve some really difficult problems. And the other element of it, I'd say, is that the lab is highly multicultural. We've had people from over 30 countries in the lab. And to me, that's important because everyone's education system, you know, different countries is a little bit different. People think differently. And so that means they're going to approach problems problems differently and they're going to come up with different ideas and and then there's also different problems in different countries that we may become aware of that we might might uh, you know have a go at how many times have uh, somebody that's not um, in that particular space come up with a solution like an engineer comes up with a solution for cancer for example and that wasn't his field or her field 
Yeah, I, you know, I think it happens all the time, and I, I think that uh, you know the, it, it's in, an inefficient process, and it could happen, you know, um, more. And I mean, my sense is that you know, when you're you're so deep into a discipline, um, you become sort of like uh, the, there's dogmas and there's things that you just start believing. And when you when when you take someone who's outside the discipline, they start asking these basic questions that can actually break down those dogmas, and then you start questioning the you know how the entire field was was um, evolved. You know, like th- there's like this kind of framework, and you start breaking down that framework, and you realize that there's completely new ways of thinking that that could be helpful. And so that's kind of my that's how I've tried to run my laboratory is that um, you know, and and it's actually very challenging, and it's very challenging because I feel like I'm always in a vulnerable position. I'm always. Um, you know, asking questions that I don't know the answer to. I, you know, it's not like I, I have all this knowledge and I'm just guiding people based on what I know. It's like we're constantly getting into new areas and and we're asking questions and 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 you know you feel insecure um, because you're going in this space. But I feel like it's like you just keep taking leaps of faith um, and uh, and and surround yourself with with kind of like minded people, but people who can approach things from different backgrounds and you know all mission driven towards a common goal um and i think that uh you can make a lot of progress so so that's awesome and i'm a big believer in it because it's happened in my life where i've come from one industry to another and it's clear as day for me and i'm shocked that the people in the industry didn't see it but um how could those listening apply it to their lives like how could they somebody said to me once everybody should have their own personal board of directors Mm. right with all different viewpoints but uh, to help them see um through the problems yeah, I think, um, I mean, one, ex- one example of something that we've done in my laboratory is, so for example, I really wanted to, to commit to not just making discoveries and then publishing them in papers and then it would end. I wanted to bring it to patients, but I know nothing about the business world or entrepreneurship. And so literally every two or three weeks, weeks since I started my, my faculty position, I've met somebody new in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, be it patent lawyers, corporate lawyers, reimbursement, regulatory Spartans. experts. Right, Spartans, <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, people who can inspire you or people who have ability to navigate, you know, the entrepreneurial, um, you know, landscape. And then I develop relationships with those people. Like literally every two or three weeks, I've met somebody new over the last like 11 11 years or so and and so as and what that's been incredibly helpful for is as we're advancing projects I feel like we need to apply a filter to keep on track you know there's a lot of practical considerations about like you know can we get a patent or can we manufacture the technology or what's the regulatory strategy so it's like you know if you have experts that you have relationships with, you can ask the questions early on and, um, and, and engage. And then those people can also, they might be available to help you later. So I think just in, as a general kind of principle in life, it's, it's you know, surrounding yourself with people who have expertise and skills that you don't have and developing relationships with these people. And, and I think that that can really be, you know, if there's a certain mission that you have or a problem you're trying to focus on, that can really be helpful to, um, to, to achieve your goals. And so I think, and, and then the other piece of it, I think, is just like constant experimentation, like constantly just trying to do new things and trying to identify like what really excites you, what doesn't excite you. And, and you know, using that as a way to make decisions about what you want to invest your time in next, because I feel like aligning with your passions is, is really leads to the most fulfilling life. Yeah, no, one of our big things is uh, knowing your true north, right? Knowing your passion, following following that. Why don't we take a break? We're, we're going to drink some Spartan tea. Yes. I feel like a late night show host selling, uh, selling something <laughs> here. Great tea. This is good, right? This yeah, is I love from it. Sparta. Anyway, we're going to drink some tea. We're going to come back and wrap this thing up. Hey, Spartans. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. We'll get back to that in just a moment. I'm Anne LaRue here continuing on our 31 Habits of the Healthiest Spartans. So we've made it through our first six. Now we're on habit number seven. Today's habit, tell someone. We're far more successful when we're being held accountable, either to ourselves or somebody else. So by now you've made it through six of our 31 habits. You've either been successful, so it's time to brag it up, or you need reinforcements. So tell someone who can help you stay accountable. I would encourage you to find somebody, a friend or a family member, that you know is going to encourage you, be there for you, and be a cheerleader to help you keep going. 
So that's all your habit is today. Tell someone, be accountable, and continue on with your habits. If you'd like the full downloadable of all 31 habits, go to life.spartan.com forward slash habits. So uh, is that unbelievable tea or what? This is great tea. I love tea. I mean, I'm trying to get more into tea, and this is really... Uh, yeah. so, you, so I go to Sparta and um, for the first time, I don't know, eight, nine months ago, and um, I'm blown away. And in the mountains, uh, probably at 3,000 meters, 2,500 meters, there is this tea that's been growing there for 3,000 years. And, and I hear about it, and I'm like, well, do you send it anywhere? Do people buy it? No. I said, well, we've got, we've got to do this, and so I'm going to stand up and show you. I, um, I packaged it. And uh, wow. we, can o- we can only get 30,000 bags um, a year because it, it literally grows up on the mountains. But no caffeine. Um, apparently, it translates to something like he is of iron. And the warriors used to use it and then rub the leaves all over their cuts and bruises on their arms, uh, legs, etc. So uh, you literally are growing as you drink. Do you guys see, see what's going on here? He's getting bigger as he drinks the tea. Stuff's right. unbelievable. You're like a bionic man now. Tell me about you had a, you had a public um, mishap. You had something happen at a, a TED Med. Talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a few years back, uh, I did a TED Med talk on yeah. one of the strategies that we use in my lab, um, which is looking to nature for inspiration. So it's it's bio inspiration. With tea. With tea, yeah. I mean, this tea is it's totally bio inspiring. Um, and and I'd say so. What happened was I get up on stage. I mean, the process really to put the TED Med talk together was incredible and and. And um, very humbling because, um, you know, I'm very insecure about, like, memorizing things. And, and so there's that whole process. It's so, super, super challenging. And finally get to the stage. And I show up. And they, they hand the... Uh, they hand the clicker to me and they say, by the way, this doesn't go backwards, right? You can only go forwards. If you want to go back, you have to tell that you have to yell out for the guy to go backwards um, in the back. Uh, and so that was a little bit, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to yell out, right? I got to get this right. <clears throat> and they said, and by the way, you know, sometimes people run, run, uh, you know, like if they, you know, they, they may start crying or they may run off the stage. So, you know, just stand there and smile, you know, if something happens and you forget your lines, stand there and smile. So I'm going through the talk. You know, there's like five high def cameras on me. It's being live streamed around the world and I'm going through it and things are going well. And then I realize I forgot a line. And so I get stuck in my mind because at this point, when you memorize something, it's, it's tough not to be robotic. And, you know, you start thinking about other things, you start looking at the audience. And so I'm like, oh, my gosh, I forgot a line. And then I was like, wait, I forget what to say next. And so I stopped. And then I remember, don't run off the stage, don't cry, just smile. So I'm standing there, and I'm just smiling at the stage, and I'm, like, thinking in my mind, like, every swear word of house we can, and I'm like, what's next, what's next, what's next? I'm like, okay, change the slide, change the slide, change the slide. So I change the slide, blank screen, and I'm like, what? Change the slide again, next slide. And then I'm like, oh, my God. I went too far. I needed that blank slide. Like, that was part of the thing. And I was like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Go, go, go. So I just was able to fire back up, and that slide cued me in. But I was literally, so I have the video of it. So they, so when I was getting off the stage, they said to me, they're like, we can cut that out, no problem, right? That's how I was getting back to the, and so, but I have at, I have on my laptop the, the, the raw video, video yeah. where it was uncut, and I was standing there for like 20 seconds, like it was smiling. literally 20 seconds just standing there smiling at the audience, and, um, and I feel like, you know, that experience to me, um, it, it really helped me a lot because in my future talks, because any time that I stop in the future, I know that I can recover and it's not as big a deal as you think it is, you know, in, in the, the moment. moment. Sure. Um, but that was pretty, I mean, that was really just so intense. And I, I had like a, a pack of hauls right before and I'd eaten the whole pack. Like I was so nervous, you know, to the, get up. The only thing I could think of, um, uh, sorry to annoy you with this, but what's running through my head as I listen to you is... Um, Colonel Nye, who's sitting behind us, uh, parachuted in to uh, Panama. Panama. Got stuck in a tree upside down, was getting shot at. And uh, that was a tough day. Um, 20 seconds on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No big no deal. Problem. First world problem. Wow. <laughs> but it's all perspective, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. CNN. What happened with CNN? So, uh, 
I, I was invited um, to MIT to this journalist program, and uh, I gave a talk, and I became friends with some of the journalists who were there. And one of them was um, the the editor for Life Sciences and Science, you know, for CNN. And so, anytime there was a stem cell story, she would contact me, and I would provide feedback. And so, um, there was this um, this cloning um, story that came out, where you know, getting close to doing human cloning, and there's a lot of therapeutic opportunities there, not just to actually clone a human. Um, and so she. She said, you know, how would you like, she, it was like a Friday, so she call, called me and said, um, you know, can you provide feedback on this? So I went, I looked at the paper, I talked to her, um, and then the article came out later that day on the homepage of CNN, and I was the first quote. Um, and we don't do quote, uh, cloning in my lab, so, you know, I had to kind of learn a little bit to be able to, to, to have, like, an intelligent quote. <clears throat> and then later that day... I get uh, an email from CCTV, which is one of the biggest television states. I don't know, they hit like a billion China. people in, in Asia. Yep. And they said, how would you like to go on live TV and debate this um, with, uh, with a, an expert from the Genetics Institute? And so immediately I'm freaking out because I want to do it, but I'm scared. I'm like frightened, you know? And so my response to them, and I've had common response like this before, was like, can we do this like not live and just tape it, you know, because it's like less of a, and uh, they're like, well, we might be able to, but it won't be as good. So I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it, and I was like, you know what, I have to do, like, I have to do this. And so I dropped everything that I was doing for that weekend I read as much as I possibly could. I looked at every YouTube video that was talking about this paper because it was really big news at the time. And um, I looked up the reporter who was going to be um, like, yeah. yeah, like, you know, and then I, I looked at the person I was going to be debating with and watch them. <clears throat> and then Sunday night, they show up in this car um, and I get in the car. I have no idea where I'm going. It's like this, this kind of studio in Watertown. You know, it's dark. We show up. They put a um, thing in my ear. I'm looking in the camera. I can't see anyone I'm talking to. And they're just like, you know, sit there and smile when they're introducing you. And, um, and, it, and it actually, it worked out incredibly well. But it, it was one of these experiences where, and I feel like that's kind of something that I've tried to do a lot in my life, which is, 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 is take risks every day. And, and, um, and you never know whether something's going to work out, but that experience can, can be like so but helpful. But you're not getting shot out upside down I'm not in, being in, shot in, in upside Panama. Down. And so the point yeah. is, the point is exactly what we push in Spartan, which is you're not going to grow. And you're a doctor, so you tell me if we've had it wrong all this time. You're not going to grow unless you get outside your comfort zone. Totally. Right? It's like building muscle in the gym. You've got, you've got to push harder, push limits. And yeah, and I think I think that it's one of these things where the activation energy is higher to do that. So you actually you have to come up with a life strategy to constantly be doing that. Otherwise, I think the strategy is just to focus on like what you're comfortable at and right. and which and most people do. Which most people do, and it's right. not fulfilling. I mean, I feel like really the most fulfilling life is the one where you're constantly taking risks, doing things you're not qualified for, and just keep pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of. I heard there's a brain study going on in Switzerland uh, as we sit here, and that they look at the capacity of the brain and obviously it decreases over over time with age and so if you just round numbers it it's like if at 20 years old you've got a level 10 um, by 40 years old you're at level six right and it continues to drop and, and common theory was that we could never get back to where we were at 20 but apparently they took 70 year olds got them completely out of their comfort zone learn some French take cold showers go for long runs do things that were just not normal in your everyday life and they got them back above where they were at 20 years old so um, that's yeah. so that's that's the science behind it right yeah, yeah, and I, I feel like that that that's the case for just skill building in general. You know, I feel like you can. It's never the, there's <clears throat> there's always opportunities to develop new skills. But I think it goes beyond that. It's it's almost like you need to have a life strategy so that you're constantly building new skills because it's incredibly fulfilling. And and when you're fulfilled, you know, you 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 basically. You know, people around you, uh, you know, are inspired and and are happier because you know you're contributing more positively to their lives as well. I love it. Yeah. All right, so that was awesome. I'm glad we met. Um, maybe I'll get you out of your comfort zone. You do a Spartan race with us. I'd love to. Would you oh do it? God, I would so love. We'll to drink do tea because you like tea. We'll yeah, do a Spartan yeah. race. What are three things you'd recommend everybody do? I mean, you're a doctor at Harvard, so we're going to listen. I think. Uh, I think. Um, 
One is uh, to to just constantly <clears throat> get out of your comfort zone and 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 do things that you're not qualified to do. Like don't be afraid and 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 it's okay. You don't have to take these massive leaps of faith, but but small ones. You know, you just yeah. constantly be doing that. So I think that's one. Um, two is to surround yourself with. But with people who have expertise and skills that you don't have, because um, be incredibly inspiring, and it may take you in directions that you never thought was possible for you. Um, and uh, and I think the third is um, to to to. Um, to really focus on 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 helping people and being a good mentor and and you know as you're learning new skills and and you know to give back to to try to inspire sure. the next generation because they need that guidance. You're awesome. And drink the tea. And drink tea. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's you're amazing. Awesome. I don't know what you guys thought, but to me, another intellectual powerhouse, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here, here's a guy who comes in, sits down, he's got all the credentials in the world, but he sits down and as we said before, quiet, unassuming, humble. But yet when he starts talking and, and when Joe is asking him for his own personal experience and, you know, what, what have you done? And he starts talking about trying to, to cure brain cancer or those kinds of things. You, you know, you're talking to a guy that really I'm not that well connected with. You know, I mean, that's 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 someone out in the stratosphere for me. And yet he sat there, like I say, and talked easily. Yeah, and you know, seemed genuinely and eager to be here with us. Right, yeah. No, I mean, he, he fit right in, right? I mean, he could have just hung out on, on a couch and eaten celery and water with us, yeah. you know. Uh, but what, what I thought it was a phenomenal interview. One of the things that I think got him there, which he talked about um, in two different places, was sort of this diversity of thought, right? Like this multidisciplinary way of thinking and way of learning and training. Um, and then also surrounding yourself with people who, you know, not only make you better, but make you think about things in a different way, um, which... You know, I think I think when we do that, when we sort of expand the way that we think, um, which, by the way, Spartan Mind can help you with because we go into oh, the nice. mindset of it. You like that weave in. Um, we I think that's actually when we can settle into conversations in a more comfortable way, because it's sort of like, you know, I might know this really well, but I can also at least talk about a few other things. You know, it doesn't feel so pocketed in one angle. Yeah. He and I actually had a, a conversation off camera. We w- talked about, you know, his willingness to not need to know everything everything. Yeah. They can bring in other experts and, uh, and be comfortable saying, Hey, I don't know about this. Can you help me? And the idea about being able to surround yourself with people who are deeper in that area than you are. And we talked about how, um, you know, a lot of young doctors coming out right now in family medicine, you know, they've been streamlined. It's like, be the best in your class, yeah. focus so much on medicine. Don't do anything else. You need to get the best marks or you're not going to go forward. I used to be a doctor recruiter in my town and I found I was talking to a lot of people who actually weren't well-rounded. Right. And he said, that is the biggest thing that young doctors need to know is that you can be a well-rounded person. Yes. Have an area of expertise, but don't feel that you have to have every single answer. And right. clearly his approach, and he said it's more of an engineering approach, mm-hmm. right? Where, where he's not about, I know everything. It's like, Hey, let's be curious here. I love that. Yeah. yeah. When, when he was talking, I was thinking of my own experience in the, in the military, you know, the mind or, or the images, I think of a lot of a guy, you know, the military guy who's in charge and sits down and, and he directs things and that's the way it'll be. But uh, on some of my deployments, these generals, I think back to about 200 episodes ago with general McChrystal, Stanley McChrystal, who would bring in every Friday, a series of experts, yeah. cultural experts, scientists, whatever, you know, to have what they would call the deep dive and sit down and would give us their takes on all of these different problem sets way outside of the military. Academics would fly in from the United States all the way to Afghanistan to spend a couple hours giving us their thoughts on how to how to uh, attack a problem or a problem set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which ties right into something you said and Joe talked about. You know, sometimes you bring that person in from a completely dis- different discipline. They actually are the one who has the answer for that problem you're working on. Right, because they're, they're looking at it from a different angle and right. they, they, they see something that you, that I mean, you, you, see. you couldn't see because you're staring here. Here, yeah. And they're over there and say, you know, if you just go around a corner, there's a door. Exactly. You know? right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and just the, the willingness to, to it's almost like a vulnerability to say, hey, help. I me. don't know. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that I love, too, is when um, when he was talking about, you know, that we we often treat the symptom and we need to kind of look further of what's underneath. Yep. Um, and and I think that that I think we do that so often in our life. Right. Like we're so quick to just treat what's happening in the present, what's happening in the now that it's almost like, I mean, not only metaphorically, but actually we we need to look in the gut, yeah, you sure, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and really have like a have like a more holistic, not re, not necessarily medically holistic, but just approach of really.
really taking in everything that's there. Right, because yeah. because he asked, uh, you know, define the problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Before you get started, you have to define the problem. And another interview that we did, and and I don't want to, because I don't know where it'll come out. Uh, but we had someone here earlier talk about ask the question of of why. Yeah. Versus ask the, the right questions. Ask right. the right questions. Why, why did you do that? Versus. Uh, who are you with kind of those mm-hmm. kinds of questions yeah. so it's the same thing you got to actually know what the, the underlying issue is yeah before you can you know start treating with all the other stuff mm-hmm. absolutely i loved his two anecdotes uh again just the the, the humility of this guy who was on uh, ted medx right and uh, and he talked about such a public stumble this guy who's supposed to know everything and he gets out there and they told him the slides gonna go forward <laughs> he realized i missed a slide and went blank and he said they told him, if you run into trouble, just yeah. smile. And he said, I smiled for 20 seconds. <laughs> but but he's right. If you ever, you've memorized things before, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you miss you miss a sentence and you, your brain knows it. Yeah. And yeah. then it stops. I love, I don't answer telemarketers anymore. Yeah. But when I used to and had time, I loved to screw with them. Yeah. Because I'd wait for their like into sentence two, stop them and ask them a question back from the start. Yeah. And I could spend hours doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have a podcast to do about exactly that. But I love too, like that idea. Yeah, you know, that the Ted people told him, like, we can't go back. You know, yeah. you just got to keep because I mean, how often in our life do we maybe say something and we want to like ah, bring that back inside, you know, but we we only have oh, the only place to go is forward. Yeah. And what's the next what's the best next thing for you at this point? What's the best thing for you to not being able to go back? Right. Right. A hundred percent. And and that he was able to use that to, to now come away much more confident about the idea. Yeah. that So what? It wasn't the end of the world. Yeah. So then CNN calls him and wants to do something on which he's not as much of an expert as he'd like to be instead of saying no he's like what's the worst that can happen yeah and he went and he studied and got the help and everything else and he delivered brilliantly but he wouldn't have done that without that first failure yeah so so i really really appreciated that and it's funny i read a thing a while ago and it was um this may not work out but finding out if it does might be the best adventure ever oh, and, and, you know, yeah. and he talked about constant curiosity and constant experimentation it might not work out but some of the greatest discoveries ever were trying to find something else <laughs> mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so he's, he's willing to put up viagra there. <laughs> or that. Right? Well, that was a, that was a high blood pressure medicine. It, it was, yeah. I'm just. The, the, the last thing I want to mention before we go to his, his last three things is he talked about how important it is to constantly be learning, be learning new mm-hmm. things, and, and the idea of neuroplasticity. He didn't use those terms, but I know but that. that's, yeah. Yeah, and just the idea that your brain can continue to rewire and mm-hmm. relearn mm-hmm. and don't let it atrophy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, so I think as I get older, that's more and more important to me. I Actually, it's funny. I, um, I intentionally gave up golf, and mm-hmm. I intentionally gave up curling. I'm decent at both. But there are things that I can get a lot better at when I'm 70 if I'm not very good at it. Yeah. Now, why be really good at it? Know that. So I have two things in the bank so I can come back to them when I'm 70 and actually get good at them. Right, right. Because I think that's important to have things when you're older, right? Yeah. So what were the three takeaways that you guys got? Uh, he said uh, help people. Yep. Right? Absolutely. That's mine. One. Uh, well, my, mine was that, that idea of like diversity of thought, Yep. you know, like make sure you have people around you that are stimulating again, other parts of your brain, other other conversations. Yeah. Curiosity. Those are two of the ones I had written down. And the other one was just get outside your comfort zone. Even if it's just a bit, just keep pushing yourself, getting outside your comfort zone. Yep. You'll grow and you'll end up being the head of medicine at Harvard. Who knew? Pretty simple pathway, right? Awesome. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Spartan Up. We're here to be your partner in resilience training for mind, body, and spirit. We've got tips on leadership, the Spartan mindset, Spartan nutrition, just living life like a Spartan. Almost every day of the week, we're here to help you stay on track. And if you like the show, help us on our mission. We want to rip a hundred million people off the couch and give them the tools to keep going. And the best marketing for podcasts like this is people like you. So please tell your friends about it and come back whenever you can. We'll be here for you.